the video on actually better than just the audio by itself because it gives the body language there which sort of yeah. fills in some of the gaps you know which uh, yeah and uh i'm recording this split screen again so oh, get both of us on it excellent all right yeah. all right well, let me uh, let me maybe uh kind of set the stage a bit by summarizing the what I wrote in the invitation to this. Okay. And that is that we, we were kind of, in our last discussion, I think we were kind of on the verge of touching on what, at least for me, is an important topic. And that's the question of, I mean, we talked about sleep as being an identification, right? And an awaking as a dropping of identifications and so forth. And so the question obviously arises, who is it or what is it that's doing the identifying? And, you know, at the end, one answer to that is the obvious one, you know, it's you and me and him and her, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, but when I, when we try to fit it into the model that we were discussing, uh, which up to this point at least seem to have really kind of three parts, you know, the individual personas, the unified person, and this ground of being, or, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of uh, non-dual awareness. And it's, I think there's some issue, or some problem of assigning any one of those parts as being that which identifies or that which is asleep or that which has the potential for waking up you know and you know one direction to go of course is is the whole distinction between atman and brahman and 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 thinking of you know in in some sense an individuated consciousness but but that's i i guess that's a direction i like to explore is what is it really that's doing the identification and consequently has the potential for waking up or continuing to be asleep. Yeah. Now, I will tell you what the ancients have told me. And I said that almost without my tongue in my cheek. <laughs> but I sort of saw it going into yeah. talking about it on the left side. <laughs> um, so, there is uh, what Patanjali refers to as the witness, the seer. Um, in his discourse on yoga. And it's always uh, the, the first verses of, of the Yoga Sutras in the Samadhi Pada basically say, here is the exposition on yoga. Yoga is the cessation of the twistings and the turnings of the uh, cognitive faculty of, of the thinking mind. When the mind becomes still, then the, the seer is in its proper place as witness to the universe. As all other, at all other times, the seer is identified with the twistings and turning of the, the cognitive mind. That's what he says. Right. Um, so what the hell does he mean? <laughs> yeah, it was explained to me that uh, what we are calling the persona, uh, what the, the teacher who explained to me called the machine, the, the meat puppet, the, uh, the part of you that is uh, ephemeral, that, that is, uh, has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and exists within your body. Uh, that's the machine. It's a stimulus response mechanism. And... It is what sleeps or, or is awake. The witness is always awake, but it identifies with the sleep of the machine. And therefore, uh, you know, acts as a sleeping thing. So when the, when the machine, when the persona wakes up, then the witness can detach from the sleeping state of the machine and be in its own place. That's how that was explained to me. 
Let me I the- like that model myself. It's it, it's one that I experience as being uh, pretty accurate. Let, let me come back to the, for some reason my audio here is kind of weird, and I'm going to unplug and plug back in. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Speak something now, because it should be coming through my earphones rather than through the speakers. All right. Is it coming through your earphones? No, it's no, not. It's no. well, actually coming through the speakers, which is kind of weird. Uh, then um, pull down your, uh, uh, the, the little old gear that gives you your, uh, your various choices you have, and you will have a choice for speakers. And be sure that your headphones are selected. Yeah, I'll find the stupid thing here. Let's go to settings. Here. Yeah, it will be. Uh, Settings, I would imagine. Yeah, settings, and it's usually on the uh, the little uh, tab that comes up if you're on a, a desktop, yeah. not on the main thing. So uh, I know that there is a way to do this. Plugging the phones, it automatically goes to them, but for some stupid reason here, it's not at the moment. Uh, Devices, try devices. Uh, where the hell is it? Stupid sound settings. Maybe sound settings. Yeah, you'll find it in the the little tab that first comes up when you you load in Zoom. Yeah. Uh, and it's on Home, so make sure that Home is clicked, and then you'll see Settings on the upper right. You're talking about the the Zoom itself, or the or the Okay, not the, not the screen where I see you and you see me. There's, there should be, if you're on a, a desktop machine, there should be another little uh, panel that has on the bottom home meetings, contacts, chats. Yeah, I, I usually have that here, and for some stupid reason here, it's, uh, okay, come on. Uh, well, speaker headphone, okay. Uh, Uh, that's so strange. Speaker setup. Well, hell with it. I guess. Um, <clears throat> yeah, weird. Um, well, anyway, uh, maybe it's not. Uh, I'm not at the moment. I'm not finding the right thing. But I guess there's no real. Down, yeah. downside of. Yeah, if you want to find that little panel, hover your mouse over the little icon at the bottom of your screen for Zoom, and it should show you two different windows. One window will be you and me talking, and the other window will be a little uh, rectangular panel. And you click on that, and that should bring it up. Yeah. It doesn't actually, for some reason. You know, if I hover over that, it just gives me the, the main window that we're talking in. Uh, oh, well, it's, it's probably not that yeah. important because it's, uh, you know, I'm getting, uh, unless you're getting feedback. You know? No, I'm not getting feedback, so we're good that way. And maybe, uh, maybe I don't even need the headphones to speak. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. So maybe I don't even need the headphones. Then. Is it any better or worse than when I don't have the headphones on? Nope, it's fine. Oh, okay. All you, right. sound, you sound like you. All right, so the hell with it all then. So let's just take it like this then. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so I'm sorry. So I, because of that distraction, I didn't completely follow. So um, so I guess my okay. Can you can you give me a quick quick summary again of, of your okay, understanding? So we have the 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 seer, the witness. The uh, that which observes the universe, that which ob- observes the objects presented to it, and the object that is presented to it at, at a fundamental level is the persona in all of its uh, myriad different twistings and turnings. When the witness identifies with the persona, it identifies with what we call the sleep of the machine. And when the machine wakes up, the witness notices that it's also awake. 
Fundamentally, the, the seer is never sleeping. The seer does not have the quality of sleep within it. Well, the yeah, that's that's of being able to identify with something that is sleeping. Right. And now, so, I mean, one perennial question is, is there one witness or are there multiple witnesses? Uh, How many witnesses can you find within you? Only one. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's that's the answer. There, are, there are not multiple witnesses. There are probably not multiple witnesses looking out through my eyes and your eyes when it gets right down to it. Okay, well, that's see, that's that's the question, and that's really the one of the core questions that's been around. I mean, you know, one one model that that's kind of always kind of appealed to me is you know uh, the idea of a tower with. Uh, multiple windows on the tower and there's the witness inside the tower and he's looking out through this window or this window or this window and has a different viewpoint on the world. Uh, but then that does suggest what you, I think, just deny, that the witness itself is the only agent and so the only agent can be either identifying or not identifying with something and consequently that, own, that single agent can be asleep or not asleep. I'm and not that, sure that the witness is an agent. Okay. Except in the witnessing or the identifying. The, the witness, the, the, uh, the seer, is, is somewhat passive. Now, to, to sh completely shift, I'm going to go back to my old philosophy professor, uh, who gave me what he called his three philosophical facts. Fact number one is that human beings can be perceived as individual. You can experience yourself as an individual. That's, you know, pretty self-evident. Right. Philosophical fact two is that a human being can perceive itself as unity, which seems to be the opposite of philosophical fact one. Wait, as as unity. Okay, but that, that's ambiguous because, I mean, there's, there's a clear sense in which there is a unity of consciousness that mm -hmm. you have and that I have, that is in, you know, all, all my sights, all my sounds, that I'm, you know, are in one consciousness, which is why I can, you know, I can hear music because this note and that note is in the same consciousness. But yeah. now you're suggesting, or at least, uh, one yeah, possible suggestion is so that your perception and my perception are also not perception, consciousness, consciousness, yes, right. yeah. being right. uh, that being is one, and uh, you you kind of discover that when you do you know you go the eastern route and you you go for unity consciousness and all of that kind of stuff you get to the point where you experience being as uh, one being, one consciousness, one one being looking out through myriad eyes. So that's philosophical fact two. Philosophical fact three is that uh, you can experience both one and two as true at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which of course is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about being both grounded in this uh, sense of you know uh, non-dual awareness and also being in the world acting yes. in the world right yeah um, that is that that the dual um, pull but also the unity right because we're doing both mm -hmm. and exactly. uh, uh, where I where I'm maybe hanging up on is the whole process of identification. So, so what is it that's doing the identifying? Presumably with a particular persona or with a particular body or so forth, or a particular thought creation. What is it that's doing the identifying? That is the witness. It is the, the real. That but then by our definition, but by our definition of asleep, it's fucking asleep, right? 
because yeah, it's identified with sleep. It's being identified with. Yeah. Right? So are you saying the witness is asleep? I'm saying the witness, the the witness, the the seer is identified with the sleep of what it sees. Okay, let's unpack that because I'm not sure I completely get that. The sleep of what it sees. So mm -hmm. I mean that suggests that. Let, so let's say it sees uh, the persona, you know, uh, Mustaf the teacher, right? Okay, yes. uh, and. Uh, so what would it be for the seer to see Mustaf the teacher? They would uh, buy, they would buy into that as, as real. That's where you get in, in the English language and in the uh, Indo-Iranian Indo language family, uh, of which English is a part, you get the is of identity, uh, A is B. That's the identification. I am the teacher, where the I, uh, with the capital I, becomes identified with the role that it's playing. But the I in this case, if I understand you correctly, is the one singular witness, isn't it? Yes. And, and so the one singular witness is identifying itself with Mustaf the teacher? Yes, because it's watching it. And because if Mushtaq the teacher is asleep to the teaching and thinks that any of it is real, then the, the witness can identify with that. And then by our definition, the witness is asleep. The witness is identified with the sleep of the machine. Yeah, but see, okay, let's let's go back to it's a it's a it's a weird distinction, but I think it's an important one. I I, I grant you it's important. That's why that's yeah. why I'm pushing and digging at this because I I do think it's important, and and I do think it, there's real value understanding it, and I think doing the kind of uh, Eastern jump of well, and the Atman and the Brahman are one, so let's just forget about the Atman. <laughs> is 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 skipping over a lot of good juicy stuff here. Yeah, and yeah. that goes back to our last talk where we were discussing the the necessity of having the persona if you want to be in the world. Right, right. So what is not clear to me yet is, and and it sounds to me like. I don't know it almost sounds to me like you're waffling on this one, but but let's let's let's. Yeah, see. that's you. That's not me. I'm not waffling on <laughs> of this at all. Not. I'm really clear about this. Yeah, it's neither you nor me. It's the one yeah. singular consciousness, right? <laughs> you know, it's doing the waffling, isn't it? Well, or is it? I mean, so uh, maybe what we need to discuss more than is the notion of agency, because presumably it's it's the some kind of an agency which is either identifying or not identifying, doing that identity. That could be. I can. I all I all I can really speak to is my own experience. So I'm sitting here, mm -hmm. and uh, there is my persona, which is the teacher at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and I am witnessing that play out. Mm -hmm. I am not identifying with that as being at all real. I realize that it's just a role, right. and I am I am seeing the role play. Right. And at the same time, I am fully engaged in the play, though I, I am not experiencing the, the play. I don't experience the teacher as me. Right. Right. Uh, there is no is of identity where the, the I, which is the witness, is going, I am the teacher. Right. It's just going, I am, or something very much like that, but without the words and then witnessing the teaching going on. And that which is being the teacher is awake to the fact that it's just a role. Right. Now it that, doesn't experience itself as real either. Right. And that makes perfectly good sense. But now let's bring in your student. Let's say it's me. Let's say I'm identified with this body or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the left side of my screen, which is where you're appearing, 
there is a role that's not being identified with. Yeah. On the right side of the screen, there's a role which is being identified with. And we're saying that there is one singular witness which is identifying on the left side of my screen with the role on the left side of my screen and not identifying with the role on the right side of my screen. Is that correct? At this point, I am slightly tempted in, to slip into solipsism here. <laughs> just just be, be forewarned. All right. Go and slip and slide. Let's see where it goes. Well, you know, it, 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 it doesn't really go anywhere, which is why I, I don't tend to use it. You know, mm -hmm. you know, from the perspective of the witness, everything out there is just objects given to consciousness. Right. Right. But there is also this phenomenon, presumably, of identification. Mm -hmm. And that... I experienced that. Definition ...requires two terminals, right? Something well, that is doing the identification and something which is being identified with. Yeah. And what I'm trying to understand is... And what that, if you want what's called a subjective terminal is, what's, what's the witness, what's the thing, it's not probably a thing, but what, what's at the identifying end of the thing? Yeah, uh, that's, that's what the Zen guys say. The Zen guys say, from the beginning, there has never been a thing. Yeah, right. Well, and, and that's true now. I mean, you know, and that, that would bring us into a discussion of, concepts and categories and their function of creating things and so forth. And that's an important yeah. discussion, which I would love to get into sometime. Yeah. But and that's where we, we begin to run the risk of, the, of the, the whole solipsistic fallacy as well. Because if you follow that down, then you can easily and reasonably take the position that all that I experience, including this conversation, including you, are just hallucinations that my being is having. They have no objective reality. I only pretend that they have a rejected objective reality, which is the one philosophical position that you cannot argue out of. You but know? that collapses the whole game, doesn't it? Though? Yes, it does. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that it's not exactly accurate. Right, right, right. Yeah. But there is that risk there. There is a risk. I grant you that. Yeah, there is a risk. But you... Your task and my interest is in awakening individuals. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, the thing is, when when the if you and I, or you and uh, I, and anyone else, were sitting here, and we both entered into a complete and full wake state, the experience would be as if one being looking out of two sets of eyes. Mm -hmm. That's my experience of it. I have, I have literally experienced this. This mm -hmm. was my very first awakening experience at a tender age of literally sitting there with two other people who were going through this, this long ceremony and uh, coming to the point where there was just one of us looking out through three different bodies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's but that you, also that also collapses the game. Right. But that's kind of what you would expect to be kind of the end phenomenon almost of this trip, right? I mean if there is a singular witness, then ultimately it's that singular witness watching through these different windows, which are many of which are flesh and blood windows, uh, and experiencing the other ex phenomena external to those windows, which is presumably arising as part of the scenery. And yet, then there should be no friggin' problem about being asleep, right? Because then that singular witness there is no problem about being asleep. Right. I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah. I could see it bubbling up in your mind. It's, it's, see, you're getting tuned in. It's you seeing the answer. Right. I just happen to be the externalization of that. Right. It's I, I am the illusion. This is all happening in your head now. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and maybe it's my interest in modeling, but I sure as hell would like to be able to draw a map which reflects the contours of what we've been talking about in terms of identification and disidentification. And I'm not sure yet that I have that map. Clearly. In order to draw that map, I would, I would expect that you would have to draw it on a piece of paper that looked a whole lot like a tesseract. A tesseract, the find that I don't sure I know. Tesseract is. is a hyper, hypercube, a cube that does not exist in three dimensions, but in at least four. Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, we are we are limited by the uh, experience of the world that we have. There, there are some things that, uh, in a three in a world of three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension, uh, we don't have access to being able to model some of this stuff because it is it seems to be at least at, at higher levels. But shit, we Big do that fact, all the time. I mean, the yeah. take, take a good physics course and we model shit in, you know, in multiple dimensions all the time, right? I mean, and we realize that the model is not true. Oh, but that's true of all models, right? One I mean, would that's, hope. That's not a critique of any particular model. You know, uh, those models... But I'm just saying that in order to draw the map that you want, you have to model it outside of this sphere. Okay, crunch. We'd have to draw it on a, a four-dimensional piece of paper, or maybe a six-dimensional piece of paper. Probably a six-dimensional piece of paper. And that produces interesting problems. It does. It does. Yes. On the other hand, there are problems that are not that unique. I mean, we have McCarter projections of globes onto flat surfaces, right? They distort, yeah. clearly, they distort. But they're they all, distort radically. They distort radically, but for yeah. some things, <clears throat> right? Yeah, the only the only uh, globe uh, global projection that doesn't distort is the one that Buckminster Fuller did, and it's hard to read because it's going in every which direction. Oh, it's all fragmented pieces. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yet, even the MacArthur, Mac, 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 whatever the MacArthur, not yeah. MacArthur, but uh, MacArthur, yeah. what a production. Yeah, MacArthur. Yeah. Is still a useful map for doing some type of navigation. So, I mean, we, yeah. we do Unless have... Unless you're, you're getting close to the, the poles and you look at it and go, that looks like four times the size of the entire globe. Exactly, exactly. And, and so that we, we grant they're always, they're misleading, but we mm -hmm. also, I think, recognize that a good projection will, will project features which are useful. So I'm not completely buying this thing that you've got to be at the dimensional level at which it exists in order to draw a map. You know, in other words, I'm, I'm, well, you can, you can definitely give it a try. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. <laughs> you, you, you would not be the first person to do that. And right. so far, the best people can come up with is interesting metaphors. Yeah. Right. I mean, you've read Flatland, right? right. Yes. Yeah. So... Uh, project flatland up into six, you know, a, a six dimensional being uh, talking to a three dimensional being, and you might get something like what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, not completely satisfactory, obviously, to me, but but yeah. <laughs> but let's let's see if we can push it from a slightly different direction. Now. Um, Let's talk about agency. I mean, uh, are we all, s does the witness have any agency at all? Or is agency really only a property of certain objects that appear in consciousness? That's like, a good question. And, and the best answer that I can think of is yes and no. Yeah, I know, I know, but I'm, I'm not going to let you get by with that. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's, that's, that is literally, I think, the best answer, that 
the, the witness, the, the seer, seems to be uh, passive, uh, at least in when it is, let me, let me rephrase that, when the seer is fixated upon the objects presented to it, then it is passive. When it disidentifies with the object, it becomes reconciling. Mm, unpack that a bit. You know, what's it becomes, but it's that's not really an act that it does, right? That's more like a happening, right? And at least um, my, when I see, um, like for example, when I see oppositions and I draw back enough to view the whole thing, it reconciles itself. It's not like I've done anything to reconcile it, right? Um, yeah, the uh, the doing of it is. I I get the sense that this is kind of beyond my pay grade. If that makes sense, uh, I'm, I'm willing to give you a temporary advance in rank. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah let's explore. you can do let's, that, but oh, let's say but, you. Uh, what if you were the general? What the hell would your answer be? <laughs> um, the general would be the the one being. The general would be uh, the one consciousness that it impinges itself into the created universe, um, and that's bigger than I can think of with with a, a finite mind. Okay, so let's so let's take yeah, it down. It, think of it. Think of it in in terms of physics again. What was going on the moment before the Big Bang? We don't know. We have no way to describe it. Exactly. It is it, it is completely outside of our wheelhouse, and that question I think is a little bit the same way because you have to go back to the moment before the Big Bang to even talk about what that is. Okay. Okay. I I can start at the moment of creation forward and come up with some some fun models, but uh, pre-creation, pre-existence is is uh, outside of my venue. Yeah. And I don't mean that as a cop out. I mean that in the same way uh, a physicist says we don't know. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, that's that's a perfectly acceptable answer oh uh, maybe not a perfectly satisfying answer but no it's not satisfying i'd like to know but i have a feeling that if i knew that my head would explode or something yeah, yeah. Well, well so let's take it down a notch um we do recognize a distinction between reactive actions and non-reactive actions right between mm -hmm. what i do when i'm asleep if you want and reacting to stimuli and those maybe in rare occasions when it does feel to me like I am able to have more choice in the matter to select an action that seems more where I feel more where I well where 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 ill <laughs> the person I are feels more uh, of an agent. Yeah. Um, so both of those, so Patanjali makes a distinction between actions which bear seeds and actions which do not bear seeds. And even, even in a, an awakened state, your actions can still bear seeds, which means that you are still creating karma, you are creating reaction in the world. Uh, the 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 state where your actions no longer create se seeds are when you're like one with the Tao, you know, when you've gone the whole Lao Tzu route and uh, do everything by doing nothing. And uh, that that's a little bit more refined. Right. So uh, actions can create seeds when you are asleep when you are identified with the sleep of the persona or when you are awake. The difference is that when you are awake and disidentified with the persona and the persona is awake and quiet, 
you can understand the seeds that you are planting and choose only to plant the seeds that uh, grow the best crops for, to follow the metaphor. Okay, okay, okay. With, within the, the sphere of what I presumably know, and the I in this case is a limited I, right? I mean, because, mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's then the notion of an age, partial agent maybe, that has a sphere of things he knows. And within that sphere, he can select sometimes an action which has the best seed potential, basically. Uh, now, so that age, and what is that agent? That agent, I suspect, is the persona. The unified persona or just any old kind of persona? And any old kind of persona is going to be that agent. The unified persona is going to be the one that really works for you. Mm -hmm. so, then, so, then, so then this persona is a hell of a lot more than just a mask, right? Um, no, it's exactly just a mask. But it's, it's, it's a mask. It, it's a mask that plays a role in the world. So think of the world as, uh, in this case, think of uh, three forces. The persona is the active force. The world is the receptive force, and being the witness, the the seer, is the reconciling force. Okay. You can model that way. So then our image of the world is basically a bunch of more or less identified personas acting in the world, which they presumably see as external to themselves, right? Yeah, I, I, I assume so. I know my persona tends to like to see the world as external to me. Right, right. And so the, the identification process is between the persona and some further object of consciousness? Uh, object given to consciousness. Given to consciousness. Yes. So you look down, there's your coffee cup. That is an object given to your consciousness. Your persona is probably not hooked to that coffee cup. Well, I don't know. Some mornings, my persona is definitely hooked to my coffee. Got you. But usually not. Right. The chair that you're sitting in is a object given to consciousness. The thought that you are having about what I'm saying is also an object given to consciousness. Right. So the persona, which is part of that thought process, is an object given to consciousness. Behind all of that is the witness, is the seer. Okay, okay, so let's push that a little bit. So here I have the persona, which, uh, which is presumably, you know, well, not just presumably, but which we, we've pretty much agreed is a thought process or a mental problem, you know. Yeah, um, in part. Uh, the persona is in part a thought process. It is in part a, uh, a chemoelectrical patterning within the nervous system. The physical body, right. Within the physical body. The, the, the baseline for me is that your persona, your nafs, is of the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and then... Of course, the body is yet another object given to consciousness. Exactly, exactly. So this persona process, this psychophysical per persona process, um, you, you call it a NAFS, is that what you call it? Or NAFS, N-A-F-S. N-A-F-S, okay, NAFS. Yeah. NAFS, NAFS. Yeah, uh, that's a, an Arabic word that can mean self or soul, or uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the specific technical term is nafs alamara, which means the commanding self. 
Okay. 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 So this commanding self process is so I guess the, the picture I'm now getting is that this 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 process, which is this commanding self, is experiencing the coffee cup and in the worst case situation, it absorbs that experience of the coffee cup as part of itself and says, that's what I essentially am on this coffee cup. Is that the process of identification that we're talking about here? Kind of, yeah. yeah. And so the disidentification this identification here is more like a clarification of the process of uh, you know, and and so the coffee cup settles down, into, uh, you know, into into it the mud. Is a, it is an experiential dissociation from the identified. Okay. It is when you literally step back from that which you identify, and and there are all sorts of ways of doing that. I mean, right. the the classic, you know, Ramana Maharishi said to to his followers. Ask the question, who am I? Keep asking until you know. Exactly. And that was a question that was designed to get them over time in trying to answer the question, to disidentify with all of the answers they came up with until they got to that silent place where there were no more words and they were actually awake. Right. 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 And at that point... We still have the persona process, right? But no longer, but that persona process is no longer identifying with any particular other object given to consciousness, right? Or does the whole persona process dissolve also? Well, that depends. You have two different things. You have uh, what the Sufis call hal and maqam. Hal means state, maqam means station. So you can have a state where you step back from the identification with the machine. Mm -hmm. And then you experience the machine as being illusionary, mm -hmm. transitory, mm -hmm. and not you. Mm -hmm. And that can come and go. Mm -hmm. People tried to do this with Ramana's work some years ago. They had these things called enlightenment intensives. I don't know if you remember those. You would sit in a room with a bunch of other people and they would, you would ask each other, who are you? Until you got fed up. Right. Right. I haven't um, experienced it, but I've not heard of them yet. Yeah, I, I heard about it and decided that I didn't need to pay money to do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, all that ever produced in people was a state. States come and go. So you have a state of awakening. Right. The station is where you live. That's the abiding part. Right. Right. And so the, 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 the state will give you the taste. It will show you the possibilities. Right. And then the station is what you work towards being in. So the station of abiding non-dual awareness is, you know, what we call enlightenment for lack of a better term. Right. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's very similar to you. I mean, Ken Goulder makes that, pounds on that distinction, distinction between what we would call a state and a stage. We yes. evolve through stages, but we have, you know, momentary state experiences, which yeah. gives us a taste and all that. Yeah, um, it at best gives us a taste, and at worst confuses the crap out of us. <laughs> so now, so I, I guess I'm tempted to now go off into what might be a little bit of a side path. Uh, on, uh, on Wilbur's model, these stages are evolutionary stages. That is, they are stages of consciousness, which actually, I think you mentioned yesterday, or the last time we talked, I think you talked about, um, you know, the bhakti path taking you to, to a certain stage of consciousness. Uh, do you, does your tradition have a notion of gradations of stages i, I would have there, thought not because you were so adamant about oh, yes yeah. that's, a, that's the answer a to that is is again both yes and no uh-huh 
Um, I, I, I will state again, in, in case somebody ever listens to this and, and wonders what the hell we're talking about, that there are no stages between sleep and awaken, and, and the awakened state. Right. You are either one or the other. And if you think that you are like half awake or, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just dozing a little bit, that's, that's just you bullshitting yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on that level, there are no stages. On the level of working and cleaning up your ego, cleaning up the persona, there are stages to that. Uh, Sufis say that there are seven seven stages that you, your persona goes through as it, as it cleans up. And just a nice octave. And at some point you're going to rattle off those seven stages, but probably not. Yeah. Really, uh... <laughs> yeah, it starts with the commanding self and then it, it moves up to the, the self at rest. Mm -hmm. And Are these, uh, the, these, the valleys that, uh, that, uh, Atar does in the, uh, in the conference of the birds or, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The conference of the birds is a, at one level all about that. Yeah. You know, you can be awake and have a completely messed up persona. Right. 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 And you still need to clean it up or get rid of it. One of the two. Okay. But we agreed, I think, several times now that getting rid of the persona is not the brightest of things to do if you want to continue functioning in the world, right? <laughs> yes, which is why the Sufis say, when you reach the state of annihilation, God annihilates your ego. And then he gives you a brand spanking new one that doesn't have all of the chips and bumps and dings in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is that a gift from up high, so to speak, or is that something that you need to build? Do you need to build your? The answer to that question is yes, to both. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know that was coming? <laughs> yeah, because it's obvious. All right. <laughs> yeah, remember that uh, it, when, you, when you go around the Enneagram, there are two shocks. The first shock is that will and intention are involved in the process. The second shock is grace is involved in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a little of each. Mm. Cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I, that's something I would definitely be interested in unpacking, but I suspect that's more something I would want to experience than essentially unpack linguistically. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Huh. All right. So what have we concluded about agency? Have we concluded that the agent is always a persona. And um, we can we can model it that way. That as far as I'm I am uh, concerned, there is no conclusion. There is only a model to talk about it. Right. And whatever model we build is not going to encompass the entire experience. So we can model it as if there is agency. We can model it as if there is no agency. Both are equally valid models uh, from a particular perspective. The question is, what do you experience? I mean, I, I use the model that there is agency, and this drives some of my philosophy friends crazy because they are all like to take the uh, human beings have no free will uh, stance. Right. In which case, I, I kick them in the shins and tell them that, that there was no free will involved in that. You know the old Nasrudin story about that, right? I'm not sure which one you're referring to. So, so uh, Mullah Nasrudin comes into his house and he finds a burglar in there taking all of his stuff and putting it in, into his bag. And Mullah says, what are you doing? And the burglar says, well, as you know, Everything is foreordained by God. So God has foreordained that I must rob your house. And Mullah goes, oh, he grabs the miscreant by the robe, picks up a stick and starts beating the snot out of him, going, God has ordained that I beat you bloody. 
at which point the burglar starts yelling, wait, wait, there is free will, there is free will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good, very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat reluctant to agree with you that all I would all hope so. maps are <laughs> that would take all the fun out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, but but and, and consequently also I have some skepticism about whether there is agency that the model where there is agency and the model where there is no agency are both equally useful in all situations. No and model. You didn't say the all situations part. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no so model is, is really useful in all situations. Right. It, trying to use a topo right. map to follow so, a freeway is, is, is pretty fruitless. Right. So what, what is the use of the no agency model? What, what does it give us? Um, you're, you're going to get my incredibly bi biased view on this. That's what I'm warned. <laughs> get your incredibly biased view on this, you know? uh, my incredibly biased view says that the use of no agency is to make people comfortable in their sleep. Hmm. And allow people to, to function more or less well within the sleeping state. Because if they accept the no agency model, then they will not be disturbed by the thought that they could actually change. Mm, mm, mm. And that's an incredibly biased view. Mm. I fully acknowledge this. Mm -hmm. but, but it does seem to point to something quite accurate, though, doesn't it? You know, um, yeah. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff would say that we have no agency but we have the potential for agency. And I think that that may be the more accurate model of the three. Mm. And the, was, go ahead. Yeah, and the, the potential is to be able to move from the state of identification with the machine and the machine just does what machines do, which is run its programs. Mm -hmm. That's the no agency. Once you disidentify from the machine, from the persona, then there is uh, the possibility of reprogramming the persona uh, to make different choices or to perhaps when entering into the state of samadhi to make uh, seedless choices. Okay. And of course, you, you probably can guess my next question. And mm -hmm. that is, you know, what is it that's disidentifying from the persona? Because that's what you just said to decide, you know, the Gurdjieff's view is it's a disidentification from the persona. Mm -hmm. And yet I thought we just discussed to say that it's the persona that does the identifying or disidentifying. Uh, no, it, it, it is the witness that does the identifying and disidentifying. Whereas no, 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 no. I, I, if I understood our discussion, the witness witnesses the process of identifying, disidentifying, but itself is not doing nope. identifying. Nope. Okay. Now so the, the, the witness will either identify itself with the processes that it witnesses or not. That's its agency. Mm. So the witness couldn't be under an illusion, basically. The witness can identify with the illusion. This is the is of identity. I am that. But that creates, I mean, that puts it to sleep, basically, right? That, 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 well, but of course, maybe that's the whole point of it. I mean, that's probably how you create this whole friggin' game is by having the witness identify with yeah. aspects of it. You know. And that's an important thing because if you want to remain comfortably asleep, you can't do that. I can, I can tell you that 
being awake in this world creates a really interesting experience when you're it is as if you are walking around. Uh, I walk down the street and I feel like I'm surrounded by robots. Mm -hmm. I watch them play out patterns. Mm -hmm. I watch people on the train as I'm going from place to place running patterns that have nothing to do with agency or reality. It's just the programming going on in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And occasionally it's fun to disrupt the patterns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not always safe, but occasionally fun to do. Yeah. And so it, it does seem like we're talking about two different levels here, right? Yeah. Because, like, take that, that, that wow that I just recently posted by Mouse Master or whatever his name was. You know, I mean, all I see through an awoken eyes is the interplay of this inner this energy basically mm -hmm. uh, and at that level i don't give a fuck whether they're asleep or not asleep or i mean they're part of the the play of the phenomenal world it's only when i take on the role the persona of an awakener or a teacher or whatever the hell that i begin to give a shit about that isn't it yeah could be there's this other thing though yeah. let me show yes. you yeah. Yeah, we both have the same problem. Our fro our phones are rude. Yes. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh, at a certain level, I don't give a shit if people are asleep or awake, but I get bored talking to statues. You look, get bored of looking at statues, is that what you said? Talking to statues. Talking to statues, yeah. Yes. It's like I, I can experience a rock as subject, but I can't carry on a really meaningful conversation with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is, if you are in a world full of sleepwalkers and you bump into somebody else who is awake, then there is a possibility for conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, uh, as I like to think of the possibility of, of no conversation. Like I like to say, the reason that people become enlightened and then help others to become enlightened is because they really want to have somebody to not talk to. To not talk to? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because um, at, at a certain level, you don't need to talk. You just sit there and it's like, yeah. Occasionally yeah. You go, wow. <laughs> Or you get up and dance. Yeah. 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 Or put your shoes on your on top of your head and walk out of the room. <laughs> Whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. 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 And I guess sometimes we're under the illusion illusion that uh my mind is really moving. I mean, uh that some dramas you know, uh, tragedies are at least as interesting as comedies, right? That, uh, and to create a tragedy, you almost need an identification, don't you? Uh, you need your statues interacting, basically. You yeah, them. you need that for your comedies, too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, it's... And, again, I guess and you know, it, it, for the Greeks, those were the first two masks, the, the mask, the persona of comedy and the persona of tragedy. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this... So, take, let's say you're talking to one of your students, disciples, whatever. Um, yes, yes. Students, friends, or protégés. I have no disciples. Okay. People um, who want disciples are, are crazy. Stay right. away from them. Right. So let's say you're talking to one of these critters, you know, mm -hmm. and you want to prod them to be on the path to awakening at least, well, ideally, maybe even awaken, mm -hmm. so you can have 
a fun conversation or a fun dance with them. So important. Whom are you talking to? Are you talking to that identified persona process? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. What I want to talk to is the witness. Mm. What I want to talk to is the seer. I oftentimes have to do things to get that, to get the attention of the seer. Because the attention of the seer is focused on its identification in the beginning. This is one of the purposes of Sufi stories and Sufi questions, which are sort of like Zen Cohen's only much more fun because you don't get hit with a stick if you get the wrong answer. (laughs) But uh, it is to catch the attention of the seer, to create that momentary uh, disidentification where you go, huh? What? What was that? Hmm. It's still hard for me to chew on this because that, that, of course, suggests that the seer. Oh, shit. I mean, but it's probably true. I mean, my experience, of course, that is true that the seer or I. Um, at times so stuck into some identification that I probably don't hear you, you know? Yeah. So yeah, okay, so that's... But, but well, if, if you're anything like, like me, that would have definitely been the case when, when you were coming up doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. But there's still my something. teachers had to go to extraordinary lengths to get my attention sometimes. <laughs> Beat you with a stick or not? <laughs> um... Not usually, though a, a few of them tried, but they were martial artsy kinds uh, okay. of people. Okay. But th- that will definitely bring you uh, to a sense of clarity when you're you know, standing across somebody with a stick and they intend to hit you with it if you can't protect yourself. Right. Right. And of course, in the Rinzai Zen tradition, the guy comes by with a wax yeah. on the back and you're nodding off, basically. Uh, th- th- there's, I mean, I guess there's still something I feel uncomfortable about in this notion of the seer itself being wrapped up into an identification yeah that could be uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's not true yeah i know but usually i find that when i'm uncomfortable in this particular way there's some confusion that i'm looking at that i need to explore and open up and unravel because this type of uncomfortableness which i'm having now and is to me an indication that there's something that i haven't looked at clearly there yet. okay and and i'm not and i'm having a trouble at the moment putting my finger exactly what it is that i'm confused about or uh, well i was just having this conversation a couple of days ago with uh, confusion. We love confusion. Confusion means two things coming together. It's from the Latin. Mm-hmm. Right. And what comes together is that which you know with that which you don't know. Right. If you don't experience confusion, it means that you are not, you are not experiencing something new. Right. You are never confused about what you already know. Right. Whether that's right or wrong or whatever. It's only when you meet the unknown that you experience confusion. Right. So we have hit upon something that you don't know. Yay. Right. right. And what happens to me at least is when I successfully penetrate that area of confusion, it results in this kind of an aha experience and a and a blowing off of a certain contraction and so forth. But it does not necessarily result in anything like a final answer. It results in a less confused viewpoint. Yeah, ideally it should result in a higher order synthesis. Right, right. 
Right. What most of the time happens with people, and I'm not saying that this is the case with you at, at this moment, but with most people, when they reach con a point of conclusion, uh, confusion, they look for something within themselves that they can go, oh, that is like this, which I already know. Right. Right. In which case they get that same relief, but they haven't learned anything. Right. Yeah. And, and what I found, find profitable to do at that, at this point usually is, I mean, I usually experience it as almost like a mass, uh, a con like a contraction of a mass. Mm -hmm. And I find that if I try to relax enough to permeate that mass, that contraction, more often than not, it begins to release and the energy begins to sort of flow again. And that's when I usually wind up with something that's a more, I don't know, more worthwhile viewpoint, but, a, but, but kind of like an aha type experience, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which I hasten to add is not by any means a, a final answer. It's, it's just a, a yeah. blowing off of confusion. And I, I'm finding that, that I'm still feeling this, this knot of uh, constriction about, around this whole topic of what individual. what in you is insisting that your present view must be real uh, as opposed to any other view that you're looking at? What are you holding on to? Because usually when, when you yeah, usually when when you get to the point of a higher order synthesis, you have to let something go. You know, you, you get rid of the useless and stuff, you keep the useful stuff, and you combine what it is. All right. And I think if, if, I mean, short of spending some time permeating this, it seems like what I'm holding on to is this notion of individual agency. Mm -hmm. That there. Yeah, it's one of the most is, comforting is, lies that human beings tell themselves. Yeah. Mr. Gurdjieff used to well, point out that, that if, we, if we realized how mechanical our behavior is and how little time we have to fix it, we would be completely devoting ourselves to the work, to almost to the uh, ignoring everything else. But one of the ways that we keep ourselves in the sleep of the machine is by telling ourselves that we have free will when we don't telling ourselves that we have agency when we don't so while there is the potential for agency most people do not or have not developed the skill or the state necessary to use that agency and that is one of the things I, I have found uh, when you point this out to most people, they really dislike hearing that. Mm. You know, I, I learned early on, don't tell people this. Yeah. Do not tell the average, average Joe, dude, you're just a robot. Yeah. You're just a meat puppet. Right. Because they tend to get like violent and want to burn you at the stake and things like that. <laughs> Yeah, not not a, not a good not a good no. result. Um, but yeah, but I mean, it's 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 obvious, at least obvious to me, that that there is this whole ecosystem almost of actions which are reactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, I also recognize that there is, that I'm sometimes out of that ecosystem, that I'm not completely caught into that ecosystem. And I think it's, it's that that I'm trying to understand. What is it that is different about that state? Uh, I mean, it's almost like I can be in the swamp or I can be, sometimes outside of the swamp and when i'm outside of the swamp i'm not i mean i'm not the with i mean i'm not consciously just the witness i'm still 
acting in the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, now my mom obviously got confusion going on here, you know, and I, I need to sit on it. Yeah, um, Gurdjieff used to use the idea of the, the, the carriage and the horse and all of that. I like the idea of the car. The car? Yeah, because we can understand that more. The car has no agency other than the agency of physics right it, that it is subject to the car has mass the car has velocity the car will will follow the rules of physics no matter what the driver has agency but oftentimes the driver literally nods out how many times has somebody said you know, I left the home and I got to where I was going and I don't even remember getting there. You know, that's an example of the identification of the witness with the machine. Yeah. And I guess as we get autonomous cars, that's going to be more likely to. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're actually giving up, uh, I think, a lot by letting machines take us around and giving us no choices to what we do. Yeah. And I, I cannot believe that there is any robot out there that has my best interest at heart. So. You mean you didn't build one with us and those laws? Uh, yeah. I, I don't think that that Asimov's laws will, will actually have any positive effect. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm sure that sentient machines would figure out how to lie to themselves about the laws, just like humans figure out how to lie to ourselves about the laws. Yeah. 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 We that that is the that is the makings of the occasionally halfway decent science fiction book. Oh. The, the sentient computer who has taken over the world has decided that the best thing to do for humans to keep them safe is to put them all in cages. Yeah. 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 And give them lobotomies. Yeah. Okay. But, 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 uh, <laughs> let's, let's take, let's take the dude or Dudette or whoever, uh, that, has woken up. Okay. And presumably one of the marks of that has been that in the advaitic terms, they've seen that Atman is in fact Brahma, that, that, that they are in fact this one and only witness. Right? Why would that not just by itself wipe out any sleeping persona. And we know it doesn't. We know because we know we have yeah. fucked up uh, enlightened masters, right? Yeah, and you, ha you have to remember that the sleep of the machine has a certain gravity to it. Mm. This is why, you know, in my experience with the people I work, work with, um, I get them into the waking state. And they can hold it for a little while. Sometimes uh, half a second, three quarters of a second. Over time, the time that they can hold it lengthens. Eventually, if I do my job and they do their job, there comes a point where they can hold it indefinitely. And when they're holding it indefinitely, do they still have some subplots going on with their personas which their which personas might be which patanjali says that you work on all of the stuff that is given to consciousness first right. then you have this stuff under it which you called samskara right. samskara are subliminal memory traces this is the deep shit right right so the first level is learn to be awake then deal with the samskaras as they come up, which they inevitably do. You will start noticing them working on you and just below the level of consciousness. Yes. This is where the real work is. Exactly. The fuckers and are definitely more. Than, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but then that, then 
uh, your awoke person still has these fucking samskaras. Yes. And so, each so, of those samskaras will put you back to sleep. So that's is what they're this, designed to do. Is this the difference between waking up and growing up or... or uh, yeah, the, it, it's definitely part of it. Yeah. But, and so the reason we talk about that person as being awake but still having to deal with the subscaric shit is because the person identifies themselves presumably with the awake persona. Is that what's going on? Um, yeah, that, that could be what's going on. Um, there was a woman, her last name is Kathleen. I think her, her first name was Marianne. It's been, been a long time. She was a student of Lee Lozowick, who was, is one of the enlightened guys. Uh, and she wrote a really interesting book called Halfway Up the Mountain the uh, premature uh, assumption of enlightenment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what happens when you wake up and you've dealt with the surface stuff and you haven't dealt with the samskaras. But now, now you're sounding to me like you're on the verge of saying that the awakening, pro the awakening is a gradient process, right? No, no. Oh, remember what I said. I said the... <laughs> Uh, polishing of the persona is a gradient process. The awakening process is either on or off. But the top of the mountain, presumably, is the awakening. That's uh, the top of the mountain is a metaphor. I understand. But, yeah. but uh, think of the top of the mountain is where you have your persona completely polished. You've got you've taken out all of the dents. You've given it the the paint job. There are no more scratches. Uh, and it and you've tuned up the engine and everything is working fine and there are no glitches in the little uh, computer onboard computer. So the top one for you is not just awakening, but it's also a polishing of the uh, the the imminent persona in a sense, right? But think about what happens if you don't polish the persona. Shit happens. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look at Rajneesh. Mm -hmm. You have uh -huh. Rajneesh and Osho, right? right? Right. And so here's here's Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh back in the uh, the early '80s, uh, late '70s, early '80s, and he's an awake guy. Right. I mean, I was very impressed with him when I first ran across him. Right. And then he managed to become Osho, who was a guy whose followers poisoned people, who locked people up, who were uh, dissident, who didn't tow the party line, who basically ran a prison camp and called it the ranch. Right. And I had a, a close friend who was at that, that camp, and it was, it was r disturbing watching what they went through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they had this AIDS camp there for people who had been uh, diagnosed with HIV as HIV positive. And it was sort of like a leper colony where mm. they were all there and they were kind of comfortable. And it turned out that nobody in that camp actually was HIV positive. They were just uh, troublemakers. Hmm. So if you were a troublemaker, you were going to get a positive HIV diagnosis and be shipped off to the camp. Really? I didn't know that aspect. Mm. Yeah, they don't talk about some of that shit. Yeah. So, Bhagwan did not finish the process of polishing his ego. Right. He mistook the uh, event of awakening for the station of awake. So you're saying that he did not ha abide in the awakened state? I am saying that. If he did, uh, or, or maybe he did, but he did with a crippled consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, he might have been one of those guys who, you know, sits in the cave and doesn't eat and doesn't sleep. I do know that uh, when he was on the ranch, he was 
he was literally unable to deal with the world, with reality. Everything uh, was toxic to him. Mm. He was allergic to everything. Everything drove him crazy. He, uh, if you got to go see him, you had to take several baths with some sort of neutral soap that had no aroma. You had to wear certain uh, materials in your garments and all of this kind of stuff because anything would set him off. Mm. And that's not a healthy consciousness. No, no, it's not. But was it an awake consciousness? Probably at that point, uh, it's hard to say because I didn't experience him then. Yeah. Uh, I, my sense is from what other people told me that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, a really awake consciousness would have looked at Sheila and gone, this woman is nuts. Yes, 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 yes. Or, you know, a, 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 an awake consciousness with a crippled ego would look at Sheila and go, I don't care. Mm -hmm. See, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is, I mean, there's a traditional Zen story of, you know, climbing up the mountain, right? Yeah. You know, the and at, I would assume, I think if I understand the stories correctly, uh, when he reaches the top of the mountain, that is the awakening. But then he still comes down to the marketplace. And what the fuck is he doing in the marketplace except polishing his fucking ego, isn't it? Or, or at least not making a fucking ego. But I least... like the Sufi version of that myself. Okay. The Sufi version is God is at the top of the mountain and he says, come up, come up, come up. And you struggle and you climb and you, you finally get up to the top of the mountain and God says, good, you're up. And then he grabs you and throws you off the other side. <laughs> to what purpose? To what purpose does it throw you down the other side? I'll let you know when I land. Okay. <laughs> Are you having a parachute as you're going down or not? <laughs> I don't think that, that Sufis get parachutes. No, they don't get parachutes. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then it, but, you know, it seems to me that that's really it, one of the important cruxes of this whole area is yeah and and this gets into buddha versus bodhisattva yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the the person who has the the true awakening experience and then sits down and composes themselves and ceases to breathe and just you know disappears back into the void you know goes to the clear light versus the person who has the awakening experience sits down, polishes their ego, and goes back into the world and helps everybody around them wake up, or anybody who's interested, or at least is nice to dogs. And that, of course, is the main split in Buddhism between Theravada yeah. and Mahayana, right? I mean, yeah. Mahayana's, you know, want to come back down to the world, you know, be Buddha shakas. Uh, but the coming back into the world part is, couldn't be seen either as what you just said, I think, I've polished my ego and now I'm coming back to serve others. Or it could be a coming back and I'm going to continue. I, think, off I think that it's the latter. I think that it, you come, come back. If you disappear, if you go into the void, the ego is no longer relevant. The ego stays with the body. Mm -hmm. If you come back, then you must go through the process of polishing the ego. If you don't, you fall off the path. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that this is the case. Okay, okay. So by choosing to be a Buddhishwatva rather than uh, Arhat or whatever the hell, no, uh, you're essentially taking on a new task. Or maybe yeah, not. pretty much. You're taking the task. Or completing the, the, completing the task. Completing the task. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure that if you have your awakening and dissolve back into the void, you haven't completed the task. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. to think, and this is just, just me, I like to think that we are the method by which God awakens itself. Mm -hmm. And each moment when one of us is awake, uh, it is a demonstration to the divine reality of how to wake up. I like that one. I, I, I like it except for this notion of, you know, God being partially awake and 
having these incremental awakenings as, as yeah, as but but no, not partially awake, either awake or asleep. Yeah, I know, but but so, but but, but don't, don't you see the tension between what you're saying there? The tension between this ink. I experience no tension between it at all. Tension between uh, in individual viewpoints, if you want, of consciousness waking up and consciousness as such waking up. Um, I do see a tension there. And I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I don't experience that because I have the reconciling force. Yeah, the, the third philosophical fact. Mm. So both of those are... Yeah. Okay. okay. And I guess maybe I'm not yet that comfortable with holding both of those... Most people thoughts. aren't. Most people gravitate to one side or the other. It's what makes a horse race. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, you know, that's that's what left me curious that after our last discussion was this this whole direction which we've been pushing at now. Um, I mean, there are a lot of other things that there are also still up in the air, but but that to me, this is a fairly central question. Yeah, and the question really becomes the question: Who is it that wakes up, and who is it that's identified? God, that sounds like one of them Zen koans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, who is the Buddha that makes the coffee in the morning? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then the damn thing, of course, the obvious answer is right there in front of us, right? Yeah. I mean, yes. if you and I, yeah. but... Um, yeah, the, the, there's a difference between knowing the answer and experiencing the answer at your core. Right. And I, I know the answer to damn near every Zen koan I've ever run across by now. Right. But as a matter of fact, I even found a book once. 101 Zen Cohen's with their answers. Oh, I remember that one. I think it's yeah, like, that I, I, I found that and I realized that that book was a Cohen itself and I spent like 20 minutes in the bookstore laughing at it. People thought I was crazy. They were yeah. probably right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, being able to, to put the, the words together in the right order is a whole lot different than the knowing without right. the words. Right, right, right. Which is why, you know, one guy I respect a lot, which is, I think I mentioned before, Junpo, you know, has his koans with the answers right there in English, right? Because yeah. they're intended to produce certain experiences and certain states of mind, you know, and then, uh, then rather than being um, an intellectual feast. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, uh, well, maybe this is, this is about, well, we can probably do it one thing. Yeah, I mean, probably have, so. We've been going for a little while here, and yeah. I have more people to talk to today. Uh, all right, and more people to bring to awakening. Yes, you know, or, or at least them to get them to laugh once or twice. See, that's why you need to have your people have a top knot, right? Saying, so grab them by the top knot and drag them up the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no top knot. Being for me. ball doesn't help, does it? No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, it's, it's there. There are obviously still stuff that's bugging me, but I, I, I think. Oh I, yeah, but I'm but we got another hour in the future. Whenever you're ready. Yeah. All right. I will. I will let you know when I'm ready. Yeah. Um, All right. And in the meantime, again, it's been a delight. And yeah. Um, and and are you okay with this one going up with our, our our other talks? Oh sure, sure. You know, I mean, I. I find it useful to watch it again, and also do send me a link, you know. And yeah. I'm, I'm cool. yeah, you'll get a link even if you don't want to talk to right. uh, to go up after we're done with it. Right. No, but, I mean, I'm perfectly fine with that, you know. Because, yeah. uh, again, it seems to me we need, or at least it's a useful example of dialogue, which helps to unearth stuff, you know, which helps... Yeah to uh, shift viewpoints and so forth, you know? And so, no, I think it's, it's a useful thing. To yeah, and, and, and 
I think that these are discussions of general interest and they seem to be fruitful, so. Yeah, they do, they do. Yeah. Well, they certainly leave me sort of energized afterwards. You know? yeah. <laughs> I'm enjoying the shit out of these things. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, that's great, that's great. You know, yeah. that's great. All okay. right, then I will bid you goodbye and uh, hopefully we will see you this Sunday. And, yeah, hopefully uh, it kind of depends, of course, my, I've got yeah. this family thing going on. But, yeah, but that, yeah. The, the whole family thing, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How the hell did you avoid, avoid that? Were you ever married or anything that sort of? I, I was married years and years and years ago when I was young and silly. Uh, you better. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, then I got better, yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had relationships. Yeah. They have relationships with lots of people. But uh, I have worked to keep my life as, as a nomad. And the times that I have let that slip away, I've come to regret. Yeah. So I'm finding that, at least in this phase of my life, I'm learning probably, maybe not more, but I'm learning from via relationships. Uh, quite a bit of stuff which I don't necessarily learn by being my, my alone meditating or looking at these yeah. samsaras or whatever the hell is popping up, you know, which is yeah. something I need to do. Yeah, and I, I find that at my time of life that uh, I do my, my nomading much slower than I used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. All right, All right. so okay. I'm going to uh, shut off the recording here.